As we move into the divorce meeting, when John declares, I want a divorce, and then six months later, we have the McCartney album release with the press release. So there's a six month period there of inactivity mm. where Lennon and McCartney, Paul McCartney essentially withdraws, mm. is not contacting Lennon at all during this time. And Lennon is kind of doing his Yoko thing. And, oh, yeah, I haven't talked to Paul, but I think, you know, things were still okay. Mm. And then we have uh, McCartney's, you know, the, instance where there's the conflict of the album releases mccartney's working on a solo album mm -hmm. everybody had sort of been started doing solo stuff at this point except for george harrison who for the some reason he was the last person to start any solo stuff most people think why wouldn't he be the first mm -hmm. but anyway that's just george so the this idea of keeping the beatles breakup secret because the day that John Lennon said, I want a divorce, was the day that they made the deal with EMI for the increased royalty rate. Mm. I think it was the same day that that happened. Yeah, it was. So I, I think Lennon maybe felt, okay, well, we got this deal done. Now I can get out, you know, because you couldn't have said we're breaking up before the deal was done because EMI would have said, well, no way, you're not getting an increase if you're going to break up on us. Yeah, of so that was one thing that was over their heads. But I, it's kind of interesting how the year 1970, Lennon's basically fighting the breakup. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. so I think that's rather interesting. Yeah, I imagine the timing would have been, yeah, they get the royalty rate, and then Paul says, right, so what should we do in the future then, lads? Thinking, you know, they're, they're still going to be an entity. Then he starts talking about let's go back to the clubs, which does seem a bit of a crazy idea. I mean, that just yeah. seemed, I know yeah. he did it with wings, but that's a whole different lineup. Totally. I like that thing he did about going to universities, but then he that that's a whole whole other beast, you know, wings. But and then I think again it's just knee jerk, you know, it's that oh, I think you're a bit I think you're daft, you know. The idea of going back to sort of slogging around in a van. I don't know if that's what Paul had in mind, but yeah, and I, yeah. I, don't think it, I don't think it means that he was going to announce it. I think it was just he came out with it that day, you know. And I think about two weeks prior to this is when the publishing, they did lose the publishing. Right. So things were starting to, they were losing their grip on the Beatles, really. Mm. And, um, you know, I think three weeks before that is when Lennon is saying, well, what do we do for the next album? Why don't we do four songs each, blah, blah, blah. And that was met with, tepid reaction from george and paul and uh had had they been excited about that maybe lennon would have had to follow through with another album because it was his idea but it, it didn't go that way so maybe he's just like well i obviously energy was waning and the band as ringo said mm. and it makes some sense but i mean but the thing is though the reaction of lennon through 1970 isn't quite he doesn't seem so anxious to get out of the beatles and yeah, he's, in a lot of his, in a lot of his, well, oh, but yeah, maybe we do a little more. Maybe we, you know, I can see us doing something again. You know, do we know the date of the meeting where they talk about doing four songs? The one that Lewis and uh, that is, I believe, the eleventh. Uh, no, no, the eighth or ninth. It was reported oh. wrong. I think it's the eighth of September. I oh, have to September. double check. Oh. Uh, so essentially, the eighth of September, and then another week they lose the publishing, and the next week is Toronto. Then the next week, John wants a divorce. Roughly, that's the timeline. It's all happening, isn't it? Yeah, a lot going on. The last time they're together, isn't it? Fifth. Yeah, nine September fifteenth, nineteen sixty nine was the last time those four guys were in a room together. If you can believe it. I think he said one or two days later. Yeah, so basically, yeah, mid. Was mid it okay? But you were saying there was Patty Boyd's birthday. Well, yeah, there was Patty Boyd's birthday in uh, early seventy seven. Spring 1970, where I, it's Chris O'Dell had reported all four of them being there. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if they were all there at the same time. But right. she, that's her report. I, I, I've not seen pictures. Maybe some will you know, surface one day. Maybe they yeah, were together. It's an amazing thing through the 70s when you've got twos. They, they're always in twos and threes. Yeah. And um, quite get them together. the Patty party, if I, I don't have her birth date handy, but I, that would have been before the McCartney album or before all that. Uh, okay. That, okay. I think. Um, and then uh, apparently their last their last time altogether, if it was, you know, let's say 16th or 17th September, 
ends with a fight between John and George about the latter's right to equal exposure on the Beatles record. So. Yeah, so this uh, this is kind of strange. I wish I had more information on that meeting because uh, a week prior, John floats out, well, hey, let's do an album, four songs each. John, Paul, and George could each get four songs. And George was kind of, you would think George would have jumped at that, but he didn't. And then Paul's kind of like, well, you know, George's songs weren't as good until recently. Yeah. Do we want? Do we want to do that? Well, that's not going to go over very well. Yeah. So here we are a week later. The subject must have come up again, and George and John have an argument about it. So I don't, I don't know what it was about. I think we always expect these great stories to end with something, you know, like like the four of them riding off into the sunset. But yeah. The last time they were ever together inside Abbey Road was the early hours of uh, 22nd, 23rd of August, something like that, or 20th, sorry. And they all just left EMI at one o'clock in the morning and said, oh, yeah, see you later. We were always kind of expecting. So the idea that their last ever meeting ended with some petty argument about who has more songs, that is kind of how rock bands go, isn't it? They end up it, fighting. It, it really is, yeah. They I fight mean, over royalties. They generally fight over the the name of the band. So we've still got, you know, David Gilmore and Roger Waters, he, yeah. both of them 80 or nearly 80, still fighting about who gets the Pink Floyd name. And unfortunately, you know, these stories don't tend to end in some grandiose way. They probably end with something really- Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's so compromised that it's, it's, you almost just hate to even think about present time. Just think about the songs and how wonderful we feel when we hear them, you know, which is really yeah. what many of us do, you know? Yeah, it is. Well, of course, uh, I don't want to go this far forward, but the very last page of the book, of course, he says that, doesn't he? Just... I guess he does. Yeah, well, should we get that far forward? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we should. It might pass 25 years. But, uh, well, uh, if yeah, you want to focus mostly on the breakup, then I think we've done quite a lot of that. Yeah, I uh, think before we get close it up here, let me just, I want to, there was one quote I wanted to bring up, another one of Doggett's zingers here. Because things get very complicated as the breakup continues through 1970, 71, 72. And by 1973, the three Beatles have dispensed with Klein's management. That's right. So that did not end well. And one of the things that Dogga talks about in the book here is essentially Harrison and Lennon are in worse shape when Klein, when they get rid of Klein, than they were when they brought him in. So that tells you something about how things progressed going with Klein. Mm. And, you know, McCartney had to start over completely from scratch, yeah. which he did on his own. And clearly he, he took the steps and put the work in to, to gain, you know, build up the old war chest again and his career. Absolutely. So one of my favorite zingers here by Doggett talks about, um, this is the post breakup time or the time, you know, 70, 71, 72. Mm. This is on page 203 where uh, Doggett says that they operated in some magical dimension where their actions had no consequences. So this is how Lennon and Harrison were essentially behaving, mm -hmm. spending money, not understanding what can be spent, what can be not, not being responsible for their actions and just thinking it's all going to work out. So I thought that was a great quote, that they operate in some magical dimension where their actions had no consequences. Yeah. So that's dangerous. Yeah, it was what allowed them to maintain their friendship with Klein and simultaneously work for his overthrow, a talent for duplicity that might have brought them success in Caesar's Rome. I mean, another, that's the guy, hey. the guy just keeps going. I mean, yeah, he's just a great, yeah. great writer and has a really excellent way of summing up what's going on here with these guys. And um, I, I think, and, and I think some of the blame of this could be on Klein. I mean, because he's supposed to be looking after their finances. Mm. And the way he's doing that is by advancing the money. So it's at some point, the Lennon and Harrison have to pay it back. So when, when they dispense with client services, I think the, the bill that combined that Harrison and Lennon owed to Klein personally was of half a million dollars. Yeah. So. And it just went on and on for a few years, didn't it? Because then you had all the stuff with My Sweet Lord. Yeah, it, it certainly and did. Klein owned the publishing to He So Fine. Is that right? He ended up securing that briefly uh -huh. and then harrison ended up getting it back at least there was a split uh, yeah. i think one owned the uk rights one owned the united states rights or something like that we were talking about earlier i said he said lennon was the king it's the master lennon was a master of compartmentalization during this period 
He retained the ability to scream at McCartney in meetings, insult his wife and her family, and then expect to work with him as if nothing had happened. And what was incredible, on the 30th of April, they uh, did the vocals for You Know My Name, Look Up the Number. And again, that's kind of a personal favourite. I'm not putting it up there as one of the great Beatles songs, but just yes. as, a, as a fun thing. But the idea that they could um, get me on the mic and do that. But again, maybe it's just a way of letting off steam and, and just saying, oh, let's just be stupid, let's just be silly for an hour or two. Well, the way I read it was that I think McCartney knew through the, we see this through the Get Back recordings and with, you know, you know, my name, look up the number and with Battle of John and Yoko, yeah. he puts in with Lennon because I think he knows, he knows how important the partnership is and he takes those couple moments to just revel in it. And that's the last time. And I think that McCartney could put his differences aside. To, to have that special time with Lennon. And maybe it went both ways, actually. I think it did, Lennon appreciated McCartney in the same way. Yeah, but, sure. it, but it was, unfortunately, I, th I think McCartney was sensing, I mean, thing, th this isn't, I don't know how much longer this can go, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he was so agreeable during those two sessions. And, and he said, like you said, it's his favorite all-time Beatles session is, you know my name, look up the number. Mm. But similarly, I think it's been overplayed, this thing about that he was desperate to keep them together. I think he did want to keep the Beatles together, but then at some point he did realise he was eventually the one that tried to get out, wasn't he? But yeah, I think maybe, yeah, like you said, he would have realised. He's really the, almost the adult to John Lennon's child in some sense. Mm -hmm. He's slightly more forward, forward thinking or, you know. And think you may not get too many more opportunities. So let's make the most of it. But I, I think they all I, felt that maybe about the rooftop or something. You know, it was just yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I think I think McCartney was certainly willing to to take the second second in command position to Lennon's. I think he willingly did that, mm. but to a point, he wasn't going to, you know, so long as it hurt the band or hurt him personally. To, you know, he he could only take it so much. You know, I think that's eventually he. He cracked and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the band. And or he didn't actually say that, but that whole press con press release that he did with his album and stuff, essentially saying well, what he said. Really, well, there's that really interesting bit of get back on the day they have the argument, 6th of January. You see him say quite openly, I've been the leader for the last two years and I'm not comfortable with it. Exactly. I don't he think does. He was lying then. I think he was probably sincere. You know? Yeah, he seemed because he was completely trying to make something out. He says, this isn't working. You know, I'm trying to lead here, but you guys, he said, I'm not going to sit around here and far around mm. all fucking day. I, I'm not getting any input. Why don't you guys just go home? Mm. He put it to him straight. Mm. And then George left, you know, a few days later, but um, he, he was, when, when, you know, push comes to shove, Lennon take, wants to take the credit for having to be the one to come and say something. Well, McCartney did it there. So that's really some leadership qualities there. Yeah. You know, Lennon could display leadership qualities too, but he typically led from behind, which is not always a good thing. Mm. Not always good for morale. Yeah. God, so interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things with Paul, he's, he's become his own worst enemy because the last 20 years have just been him trotting out all these old stories. And anytime someone tries to ask him something else, he kind of tends to move the conversation toward, back towards that. So he's, he's got this reputation now for being a bit kind of uh, relying on the same pattern. But he's actually quite open in back then. And in interviews he did, um, he's, he's much more open than he's given credit for back then. I think it's now he's sort of shut up shop a bit and he kind of goes behind these old stories. You know? Yeah, he's a bit defensive. Mm. And uh, he's not always comfortable on camera. So sometimes when he's on camera, he's just he's just... You know, he's just not, he plays it in, through his songs. He plays it a little more close to the vest. You know, he doesn't really, he, he doesn't have a plastic Ono album. Surprisingly, he didn't ever do that. People like, people like to say that Ram is some kind of equivalent of homespun domesticity or something. No, I think there's a big mask over that. And that's just how he is. It's nothing wrong with it. Doesn't make him any less of an artist in my view, but it's just how his personality is. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, he definitely has the artistic temperament. No doubt about it.
I think it's just a bit more stable and, like I say, a bit more adult, for want of a better word. And John Lennon admitted John. that in the mid-70s. Yeah, Paul is more... He, well, it was in the Jan Wenner interview, because Wenner, you'll notice this here, you know, some people, these Phil Spectors and the Jan Wenners try to take pot shots at McCartney in Lennon's mm. presence, and Lennon won't have it. Mm. He, <laughs> Lennon's the only one that can dish on McCartney, and anybody else, he, he doesn't, he'll let you hear about it. Yeah, who did he say that to? He said that to someone, because I used a clip of it on one of my recent shows. Well, he, it was a Jan Wenner thing, and something you just said and reminding me of it, where Wenner was calling... Paul, uh, not conservative or something, but but Lennon changed that word. He said, no, no, he's just more stable. That's In other it. words, what McCartney, he was complimenting him on his uh, level-headedness. That's it, yeah. Well, they were talking about drugs, weren't they? They said me and John, me and George were always the more cracked. Maybe, so probably maybe. Did more LSD or whatever. And at that time, yeah, you know, yeah, I think Wenner was trying to lead him, you know, obviously drugs meant counterculture, that meant cool. Mm. Anti-drugs meant establishment meant uncool. That's where that's where Wenner was going, predictably. And Lennon yeah. took him off that path. But he's a kind of a teenage thing, isn't it? To think that anyone who's straight in any way is not. And it's, fu it's funny how grown adults still think that way to this day. Drugs are still kind of cool. This whole 60s vibe, you know, the tie-dyed shirts and the mm. the Jim Morrison, you know, all that stuff, all that cool stuff and how cool it is that they got so loaded and all that. I still see that with, you know, people in their 60s, 70s, you know, it's just like, I don't think anyone's immune to influence though, are they? I mean, you know, no, certainly I always not. talk to people about on my, my other podcast, Life and Life Only, we talk about advertising and stuff. And, well, yeah, so I, I mean, know a few of the tricks, but I'm not immune to it myself. You know, yeah. the John Lennon image, that image that I grew up with in the 80s, late 80s when I became a Beatles fan, it's so powerful. You know, the, I mean, you've got the long hair and the glasses yourself, but you know, <laughs> that whole thing, you know, the long hair and the glasses and the, you know, that whole Lennon image is so strong, isn't it? And it, it does appeal to people, you know? Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, people like, like heroes and yeah. uh, it's hard it's easier to focus on a singular person as a hero than a band yeah you know, and when you mentioned the lennon image in the 80s you know what i what popped into my mind was just a singular image of him and not the beatles i don't mm. think of the beatles in the 80s i don't and the image doesn't come to mind but the lennon image comes to mind because that's when he was deified or you know all this yeah it was that all that stuff the that all that sainthood began well i think the imagine documentary from 1988 which doggett actually mentions in the other book that i showed you earlier mm. that totally cemented it because that that is just it's a very very well-made film we did a review of it you know it's a great film and it's a great if you take away obviously the tragic ending it's a redemption story of a guy reaching 40 and you know getting this rather oversimplified arc where he's kind of conquered all his demons and then the murder is treated in that film as the tragic end to a to a redemption story, you know. So that image is is very very appealing, you know. If you watch that Imagine film, yeah, and I definitely recommend it as a kind of a John Lennon starter kit. Same with the Ray Coleman book, you know. But you have to delve a bit further because that image is very very strong, and it's very very appealing, but it's not entirely accurate, as we know. Well, yeah, I would. In fact, it might be, that might be a very kind way to put it. It might be a little bit, uh, this is propaganda, you know, for yeah. some, you know, in, 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 we may never know 1975 to 1980 because Peter Doggett's other book was just halted this brother. earlier this year. So this, the book Prisoner of Love, which was green lighted by the Lennon estate, I don't know who the publisher was, but apparently this book was going to be delving into this final period of Lennon's life, the one that you just referred to in the Imagine has this kind of tragic ending after the redemption. Well, that's the party line from the Lennon estate and has been since the death of Lennon or since the double fantasy album was released. Yeah. And there's been a lot of things that have come out that have suggested, well, now that's not at all how it really was. Um, and some people fight that because they, they want the image of Lennon up there to worship. And, I don't think humans, it's a good thing to worship humans. And I don't have any problem 
mentioning these other things that make him unworshipable, worshipable, you know? So that's this prisoner of love, I assumed was going to be more along those lines. And yeah, apparently, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say, uh, Doggett was actually on a very good podcast called Let It Roll. Uh, big recommendation to you and your viewers. Ah, was this recently? No, unfortunately, I can't find it. It was about two years ago, I think. And it's not, it's not on there. I think they only display a certain number of back episodes, but I, I'll try mm. and find it and I'll send you a link if I find it. But Doggett was on there. He wasn't talking about, I think, it, or maybe he was talking about this book. But they actually got onto that, and he he definitely skews nearer the Goldman end, just like me. You know, if you took take the continuum, I'm probably about sixty percent towards Goldman, you know, six, maybe seventy. Um, but it, it was incredible on this Playboy audio. Uh, he actually says, I mean, it just blows my mind to hear this. He says, "There's not one song on Double Fantasy that I had to work very hard at." Um, you know, it was all inspiration. Where the the truth is is not only different; it's the complete opposite. Opposite. You know, that, yeah. That is what's so nuts about the whole thing, is that when the Lost Lennon tapes came out in '88, and I mean, I wasn't wasn't quite the big enough fan at that time. I was just getting into them around '88, '89. You know, when you find it, you discover that the the truth is a total opposite. He, he may have spent three years on those songs. You know, and they, and they came with little bits where he's giving the complete difference. So, you know, unfortunately, you have to say the guy is a very, very unreliable narrator. Well, this, you know, that time period when they're pushing the album, it was decided upon we're going to push this Yoko John, John Yoko love story to the max. And here we're doing this album together. And it kind of works. It, it, but I mean, I mean, a healthy skeptic knows better. And Doggett looked like we, he was gonna. We were gonna finally have a writer who is respected, mm. unlike Goldman, unlike Fred Seaman, unlike uh, uh, the guy, the the tarot card reader. What's his name? Uh, John Green. John Green, yeah. and then the other guy who wrote on Lennon's um, diary oh, for memory, Robert. Robert, Robert, Robert Rosen. Yeah. 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 So all these people get vilified mm. for one. Oh, they're unreliable, or you know, I mean, Goldman. He deserves a lot of derision because of the style of his writing. But unfor unfortunately, a lot of his research is really considered to be well done. Mm. People, as far as Mark Lewis even said how, how good it was, and he did a lot of interviews. So all this stuff, Doggett apparently was going to use and compile something for us that was going to be something new oh. that would be coming from a, what is known as a balanced source. And at the last moment, the rug gets yanked out from under him and the publisher. And apparently the Lennon estate called a stop to it. Now, why? I don't know why this happens. I mean, if they green lighted it, maybe this was the plan all the time, essentially to pay the publisher and dog it not to print it. Yeah. So I think there's probably a payoff. Okay, we're going to make this ain't coming out. We're going to take the... Um, the uh, litigation to the max, or we'll pay you not to print it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, if it ever comes out, I'll be first in the queue. Uh, these things have a way of getting out. And yeah. um, in this day and age, and, you know, I, I don't know. It's a shame. I mean, he, this is something that nobody really knows much about those last five years of his life. Only that these interviews at, at the very end that he's telling these tall tales. And people want to believe that. I don't want to believe that if it's not true. Oh, some of that may be true. Maybe he was actually baking bread for five years straight and got very good at it and thought of opening a bakery. My guess is he'd probably bake three loaves of bread, you know, and yeah, mediocre. Probably. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've done some baking in my day. It takes a lot of work to get good at those kind of things. Yeah. Some, <laughs> of, those, some of those cakes as well. Yeah. Exactly. The John Lennon special. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. But, um, yeah, Ray Connolly wrote a book called Being John Lennon. And to be honest, I wasn't that impressed. It was just riddled with errors and there were loads of photo caption mm. errors. It was, a, mm. it was kind of, but but he did find that middle ground and there is an accepted middle ground. And if we just take one example, the idea that um, when, when he played with Elton John at Madison Square Garden in 74, mm -hmm. he and Yoko locked eyes and that was it. They were back together. Whereas he actually went home with May Pang that night and even a couple of months later, he uh, told her he was going to divorce Yoko. And um, yes, 
Could we, uh, can I make a request? Could we maybe talk mm. about the January 1975 smoking cure incident? Yeah, so... And I'll tell you why, because you, mm -hmm. you were on my show we did 1968. And if you remember, Cynthia describes seeing John and saying it, it didn't seem like him. He had a very kind of vacant look in his eyes. Do you remember that? Yeah, it wasn't the John I know. What power does she have over him was her That's quote. Um, mm. Yeah, so Doggett does go into the entire solo period of the Lennons, McCartney, everybody, because there's all kinds of excellent ramifications of the business. Yeah. And um, so as we get past uh, to the end of the so-called lost weekend period, mm. when Lennon comes back, um, so this part, this is also a come forward. And what Antony was referring to is, so May Pang is, this. these are the last days, and Yoko is wanting John to come back, apparently. She has this cure for him to cure his smoking. Mm. And yeah. May Pang talks about this being, I had a bad feeling about this. Didn't want him to go. He's like, ah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And at this point, there was, the divorce was being talked about. I think they had consulted a lawyer. They were looking at buying a house in New York. That's right. Him and May. So things were slipping away from Yoko Ono if she indeed wanted to the relationship to continue so mm. so she john lennon goes to yoko's and um which i assume is the dakota and um what what is reported is that the smoking cure he drank some kind of brew or something and it was vomiting and vomiting is when may pang saw him when he returned that night pang said he was a different person about paul because we know almost for sure that he was going to go to new orleans wasn't he Oh, that's correct. Yeah. Probably, so there was a lot going on here. Paul he McCartney would have contributed to Duke, Venus and Mars, I'm pretty sure, either singing or, or even composing, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, but it's this idea, what we said, uh, as you said, with Cynthia, when we did 1968, it's, it's almost the same thing. You've got like um, um, a fairly, I don't know, straight person. And I mean that in a good sense, like Cynthia or May Pang, fairly normal woman who kind of just is in love with him and wants the best for him. And they just discover this whole other person and the whole thing. The thing about John Lennon that's both compelling and must have been maddening if you're a, what, if you were an intimate of his, is that, some, you know, he can be making all these plans and we're going to go to, v to New Orleans, Venus and Mars. And then it's just like on a dime, it's just all this yes. just goes out the window. You know? Yeah, his personality. It's not a gradual thing, is it? Yeah, he, he went from, yeah, let's go visit Paul and Linda. Let's go down and get, get with him in New Orleans and yeah. all gung-ho about it. Then, boom, he's anti-Paul all of a sudden and without provocation. Yeah, because on, uh, on this documentary, The Real John Lennon, which I said, some of it's online. I would recommend it if you can find it somewhere. Um, uh, what was it she said about him? Yeah, it was, it was something about... Um, yeah, she said something like he could just change on a dime and he was he's just like a completely different person. And mm -hmm. the other thing is that she said, I didn't want to be his mother. I wanted to be his lover. And again, this is, a, again, totally theoretical. Maybe John Lennon just didn't want to grow up and have a proper girlfriend in May Pang, you know, and maybe have a wife. Yeah, I think he needed it's somebody to go back into the womb, so to speak. You know, that's the thing. Yeah, it's, it's as if he needed somebody to not take care of him, but handle him. You know, so y Yoko seemed to be was. become the handler, you know, and I think he craved that. It seemed like he, he was, um, op you know, he was totally open to that because May Pang, he would have had to carry too much of the burden, maybe, of responsibility because she yeah. was not going to do it. Just going back to what I was saying earlier about this arrested development in, in rock mm -hmm. stars, you know? mm -hmm. maybe they can't handle serious quote unquote relationships. I mean, I think, I think with John and Yoko, when we've talked about this on uh, on my podcast, we I'm fairly clear on how the story was till about seventy three, and I think they spent five years in each other's pockets, and he got the seven year itch after five years, or she did because she had a fling with David Spinoza. That's fairly well known, so I think that bit's fairly clear. But it's then it's the seventy five to eighty, which obviously I covered ad nauseum. But it's yeah. again like just talking about it to you now. It's still fascinating, you know. It's still because we don't know, you know. And we want to know because we, know. We're, we're, we love we this knew, guy. But then if we knew, what would we have to talk about? Then? <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs>
Yeah, it's part of me wants to know. Part, part of me wants Peter Doggett to give me some clue, but maybe still the mystery is, is the intrigue. I mean, do you know whether John and Paul were set to collaborate in 1981, or is, is that speculative? Uh, you know, I'm not clear on that no, because no. Lennon seemed to, you know, he back and forth. He had this like Jekyll and Hyde thing with McCartney. Mm. I, I'm just shocked that he was so preoccupied with McCartney. 78 79 period anyway and this is according to what was mentioned in the diaries and things like that I, I just find that very very strange mm. and uh you know it seemed to me that um lennon at some point you know i i believe that had lennon lived there would have been some kind of anthology would have been some kind of a, maybe not a reunion where they would have played live or anything necessarily but something where they would have done a commemorative movie or documentary or book like they did without him uh, and I think he would have reveled in that because I always found Lennon to be a very sentimental guy, mm, nostalgic, yeah. nostalgic guy. So I can't imagine him not being that for the Beatles. Mm. So I think that would have happened in some way. But, you know, I think that uh, there was a path, there was a trajectory for John and Paul to, and all the Beatles really to get back together on some even ground after all the business has been settled and to just to be friends. I think that would have been good for everybody it doesn't mean they would have recorded together mm. it seemed to me that yoko was not a big fan of them you know her, her, john getting together with the guys mick jagger bore this out mick jagger said very openly yes. when uh during the lost weekend period uh that he saw Lennon regularly and wanted to see him and once he got back with yoko i guess i'm not going to see him anymore and that's how it played out so i mean this is again as i said earlier this is fairly common in relationships with wives and not one of their husbands to get out. I don't want them going to the strip clubs, blah, blah, blah. You know, all that kind of nagging type of husband and wife, you know, marriages essentially. So, you know, maybe Yoko took it to an extreme. John, maybe he could have gone, Hey, Mick, I'm going to next. Shut up, Yoko. I don't care what you say. I'm, we're going to go down to meet Bowie down at studio 54. You know, he could have done that, but he didn't. Well, there was that period around 74 when he was promoting Walls and Bridges because he obviously, he had a bad start to 74. He had the Troubadour and then he had the Toot and a Snore, you know, which obviously mm -hmm. didn't come out at the time. But by about late 74, he seemed to be just like incredibly charismatic and kind of clear-headed. And that was a great time. And that was when he was with May Pang. And so going back to what we were saying earlier, but can I, do you mind if I just read one more thing? Um, yeah, go ahead. This is about how you get the two Johns. You get the English John for one day and then he's completely changed. So Lennon's friend, Pete Shotton, and I'm sure your audience know well about him, but Pete Shotton was John Lennon's first inseparable companion. So you had this, you had him and then you had Stuart Sutcliffe, then you had Paul McCartney, then you had Yoko Ono. So you have this continuing trend of uh, him needing this constant companion. Anyway, um, Lennon's friend, Pete Shotton, who'd known him since they were five, offered a disturbing portrait of the artist in retreat. And then he says, uh, he left a message, Lennon invited him over after ringing his numerologist. Um, okay, that evening, Shotton found his friend warm, funny, and at peace with himself and the world. It was the real John Lennon, the one I always knew was there. But two days later, when Shotton called again, in the background, I could hear Yoko shouting something. And John saying, look, Yoko, he's fucking coming over and that's it. John didn't realize I could hear all this. And he said, they went to dinner. They were both uptight. They hardly spoke to each other or to me. John looked pale and drawn, not as fit or healthy as he'd looked three days earlier. We didn't talk about the old days, just about the occult and mysticism. So it's just this changing on a dime. You know, it's quite amazing, really. Um, yeah, I don't... I can't explain that it's very very strange it's very sad actually that yeah, he uh and he just retreated into the dakota really for five years i mean he, mm -hmm. in the vacations they took typically were to japan yes and they were, he never made it back to england yeah. and he had family there and he had responsibilities there he had investments there on some of the family's properties that that fell through the, the family's fingertips after he died so yeah, it's, it's it's to me it's a very sad existence those last five years, and I don't think there's much encouragement much encouragement for him to get out in the world, and to experience the world outside of the Dakota. 
that's just what appears the evidence that we have i think what you said earlier i'd never actually thought about this was that he'd never got help you know apart from primal therapy which was like i say this very very extreme thing i, I think you know like yeah. i say in the 80s maybe he would have had a course of proper therapy and maybe he would have come out of it but the other thing about it of course maybe he would have felt like his art would have disappeared if he'd got therapy you know i'm not sure i i will say that the, what the substitute for the therapy in the 70s was this numerology and this this yoko being involved in the occult and bringing in these soothsayers and these tarot card readers and they couldn't make a move without these people and john green's book um he basically was a life coach you know whether you you know whether you believe in the power that uh behind the occult uh this john green seemed to be um more of a life coach and and that, that i mean to me that's not therapy but i I'm, and i bring this up because to me and this was ongoing for the entire time till he died that was i think the replacement for the therapy you know it's funny i'm a, i am actually a life coach and i can contest it. i don't i don't want to put it down because i think i've seen amazing results but it is mm -hmm. kind of therapy light in a sense yeah yeah you know i mean i i might have a client who's got a certain amount of anxiety and we talk through that but if they've got severe anxiety then i'll refer them to a therapist you know it's that kind of mm -hmm. thing sure um, but i've never read that john green because it's for some ludicrous price online but no it's cheap i just got i just got it i think i got it for about three bucks well, i haven't read it through yet um but uh it's on my big stack of books to read <laughs> yeah, yeah there you go not enough lives but yeah that, that was 83 in fact yeah so and then that guy disappeared he yeah, had not to be heard from since yeah yeah he hasn't the only thing he's ever really written yeah we haven't even talked about morris levy yeah <laughs> yeah john well i'll tell you what this book has got so much in it you know Auntie yeah. and i are just we're scratching the surface here so if you're looking at getting clarity on the breakup and just the what's behind some of these business deals this will really help you and it just explain the quagmire of business entanglements that the beatles were in just adding to the overall pressure mm. and i bring this up because i think this would this would be hard on anybody so this uh, the business aspect of their union was very very mangled and must yeah. have caused tons of stress so it's to this yeah, I day i don't even know if it's that if it's untangled pretty much now but boy it came at a price you know all the stuff with apple computers as well <laughs> Uh, the Steve Job, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I just cannot recommend this book enough because it's it manages to pull off an incredible thing, which is to basically give you a story of business entanglement, but in a very, very entertaining way. And yeah, I, we, yeah, just can't recommend it enough. Can we just? Can you read that last paragraph? Because oh I, yeah, I so, so well, I'll, I'll read a portion of this because Doggett. Because okay. um, this goes through through the end of the '90s for sure, if not later, or early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. And in the, in the end, Doggett basically says that the music needs no mythology; that it's both timeless and a staggeringly accurate document of the age from which it came. So he's basically saying, you know, what we've been trying to do, and I just did this three part series on why the Beatles broke up. You know, um. Mm. Good luck at that, Matt. But we still got the music, and that tells yeah. more truths than really anything, you know. Yeah, in a sense, it does. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, I, I think I've reached that conclusion already. We've said on one of my podcasts, you know, in the end, you just stick the records on, and everything else goes out the window. Because obviously, yeah. a lot of these people aren't even around anymore. You know? Right, and it's almost like the Beatles when they were making the music, everything out went out out the window as well. And, and Ringo Starr said that in the anthology. Yeah, of course. So I, I think that's the in those people watching this that are are musicians that have been in bands and get that magic when you get when something's really grooving. Oh. And to, to have that on the Beatles level, grooving on that level, creating that kind of music, man, that must be the ultimate high. Mm. So I, I can see where um that would have they would have found solace in that. Here he, then um Dogga finishes up by saying the soul of the Beatles turned out to not to reside not in the boardroom of Apple Corps 
or the bank accounts of four millionaires, but in the instinctive, natural grace of their songs. Their collective genius created something that not even money could destroy. There you go. That's some like good writing. <laughs> that is some really good writing. So that's yeah. why that that is why I recommend this book highly. And I'll leave a link at the bottom so you can get to it quickly mm -hmm. uh, underneath here. And yeah, um, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I don't know really how to close it up better than Dog did in the last paragraph. <laughs> Have you got anything, Anthony? No, that's it. I mean, that, that's just that's just perfect. You know, um, I think also you can learn a lot from this book. Uh, you know, about being an artist, about being a businessman, about being an artist who's not a very good businessman. And it's a human story. That's the whole thing with the Beatles. At the end of the day, it's a human story. Yes. It does a fabulous job, circling back to what you said right at the beginning, of making them all uh, appear as they were, human and flawed. And I think finding the Beatles, the humanity in them, meaning their flaws, it, it, it's easier to love them, I think. And um, hmm. it's it's easier for me. I, I don't ever have a problem. One of my commenters said recently after I did this um, 10 Reasons Why the Beatles book, he said, you know what? We have too much information. We know too much about these guys. And a, a lot of it's, we don't maybe want, care to know about some of this stuff or it's not good news for us. Hmm. But for me, the, the music just wipes all that away just just destroys all the bad mm. in in whatever because it just it just does for me plus also we're coming up, obviously we're coming up to christmas it's the 17th of december today um yeah. if you want a really good summation of the beatles career then listen through the christmas records you know those fan club very true because yeah, you can listen true. to them all in one go and that that is the beatles story and that there's loads of fun in those as well Yes. You get the whole trajectory, like very chirpy at the beginning, then getting a little bit jaded. Then the middle ones are like a pantomime. And then the last two are recorded separately. I mean, it's perfect. But yeah, yeah, it's all about the music in the end. But you can learn a lot about life, I'd say, from this book as well, definitely. So. And a lot about yourself, too, if you just put sure. your biases aside. It really, it's that good of a book. That's a good writer that can do that. It is. And then the other one, uh, just to mention one more time. For Lennon fans or any any beat. I'll have to get that one. I don't have that one. Yeah. Please try and get that because it's just it's just remarkable the amount of stuff he did. Again, whether you like it or not, he put out a lot there, you know? Mm -hmm. Him and Yoko in particular. And mm -hmm. um, if I could just mention for Glass Onion, I've just done my last podcast of the year. She went out yesterday. And it's, um, I've been getting requests for years, people saying, oh, do a John and Paul episode, please. And I was so intimidated, but I managed to put one together. It's about, it's about two hours, 10 minutes. It's pretty long. It's got tons and tons of clips. So I put that out on Glass Onion, yeah, Two of Us. I called it Two of Us, The Ballad of Lennon and McCartney. So there you go. Oh, very good, very yeah. good. Adding my- uh, Can't wait minutes. to check it out. Yeah. All right, Anthony, well, very good. Well, let's, um not take any more time for the, the viewers here and yeah, this, i could talk i could talk about the, could talk about the beatles forever right <laughs> yeah yeah we only got through five pages of our notes so. yeah well no, thank you very much for having me on yeah it's been well fun. yeah i'm glad thank you for coming back on here and uh you know i'm sure we'll have you back always something to talk about with the beatles so uh, and here we are at the beginning uh dawn of another new year and uh got another year worth of great topics to go and there'll be a lot of beetle topics so i'm sure you'll be back yeah thank you very much can i plug my podcast before yes I... please do <laughs> yeah glass onion on john lennon available everywhere and then life and life only is a sort of psychology life coaching as we mentioned earlier and kind of veering on alter alternative media as well alternative news sources and then film gold is films and um i could send you the collaborations we've done before if you want because Matt was on uh, Glass Onion very recently, something like June, I think. I think so, yeah. We went out later and we did, we did 1968, a massive two-part deep dive on the year and then John Lennon in that year. So, yeah. And, um, yeah, the guy just, all the Beatles fascinate me, but he just endlessly fascinates me and I don't know how, don't know why I'm still reading books about him and I'm still discovering new things. That's the thing, you know? There are still little tidbits of information out there, you know. And more will be coming out. You know, it's amazing how much I, some new bootleg comes out. I haven't heard this before. It's amazing. So, yeah. 
and if nothing does come out again we got plenty so yeah and as i mentioned these play that these playboy interviews about three hours of audio and we've heard some of it before and i have the book the book called all we are saying the playboy interviews but it's there on uh, youtube now and i've listened mm. to about an hour but it's quite revelatory the thing it said about yanoff and all this all this lying he was doing in the last month or two about all these songs being from inspiration but <laughs> i think john lennon always even for people he treated badly i think he always had that lovable sense to him so um, oh yeah and he he never gave a bad interview they're all they're so fun to listen to he's such a great order you know i just love hearing him talk and like we were saying doggett almost emulates lennon in that he can he can really sum something up very well with one killer mm -hmm. sentence you know? yeah so, yeah um, yeah Thank you very much again for having me on. And I'll get right. you on Onion next year, I'm sure. Very good. Mm -hmm.